Welcome aboard, everybody. Time to grab that board and swim out into the sea of ideas. Because we're going to try and see if we can catch the sales pipeline with the, uh, you know, you've heard of the uh, Wizard of Wall Street or the uh, Wizard of Omaha. We've got the Wizard of Martech here with us today here, Matt Hines. We do. Well, it's a, it's a, how you doing, Paul? First of all, I'm doing good. I'm good. Good here. It's a beautiful day down in Southern California and I'm, I'm uh, eager to hear all about MarTech. Anytime I hear, you know, um, uh, the word tech or I hear little acronyms like that, I go, wow, I gotta, I gotta be up in this. I, I you know, marketing technology, well, that sounds okay, but MarTech, boy, that MarTech catches. MarTech sounds cool. Yeah. yeah. You, you shorten it to that. It just sounds cool. Exactly. It's got a ring to it. We, this, this might be one of our more diverse shows ever today because we're going to be able to talk about marketing technology, mm. improv comedy, college Ooh. football, professional wrestling, oh. all in one episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. I Thank can't you very wait. much, everyone, for joining us on another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. If you're joining us on the live radio, Funnel Media Radio Network, thanks so much for joining us. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you for subscribing. You can always find our future episodes of Sales Pipeline Radio on the iTunes Store, on Google Play, and everywhere that fine podcasts are found. And every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio can be found past, present, and future on salespipelineradio.com. We are regularly featuring some of the best and brightest minds in sales and marketing and B2B, and today is no different. And and I think, Paul, we've talked about you know having a college football show, and as we record this, it is uh, Labor Day. We are a week before Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend is traditionally sort of the official start of college football, the college football season. There are a handful of games this coming weekend. I believe on Saturday we've got a couple mm. um, that are coming up, and uh, I know that our guest today – She's also a huge college football fan. We've got Marilyn Cox. She's the vice president of marketing and CRM at the Second City. Marilyn, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. How are you? I am doing great. I'm really, really excited that you were able to join us this week, and you know, for for a variety of reasons. But you know, we are on the precipice of another college football season. I know you are a proud alumni and diehard fan of the Ohio State University. Uh, so oh, maybe God. start out yeah. a little bit with. Uh, you know they have a they have a bit of a tough schedule this year, but a really strong roster, a bunch of returning guys, a, a young team that's starting to learn how to play together. What do you think? I'm psyched. I mean, I think if we can rise above a little bit of the upheaval that we've had leading into the season, it should be really, really good for us. And I mean, if you know anything about Urban Meyer and the teams he coaches, whether it's at Ohio State or Florida or anywhere else, uh, he's amazing at really back in the bench so i think it's going to be a, a great year for us now matt i have to tell you that i may not make that into the podcast because i'm a loyal u of m alumni from the university of michigan oh, here so ow. i was really ow. you know i was hoping not to bring that up because <laughs> I, just, I didn't want to have i didn't want this to digress into just you guys picking on each other a mud ball uh, a, a, a fight to like fight to the finish yeah sad. we're gonna keep this above board this is a family show um but uh yeah no i think i am super excited about this season this year i think uh you know i know as, as we you know record this a day after urban meyer you got a three-game suspension for uh some stuff some not good stuff going on um you know behind the scenes at the athletic department but i guess the silver lining for ohio state this year is those first three games are non-conference games against not very good teams so highly likely uh that ohio Ohio State emerges 3-0 and into conference season, and it'll be a lot of fun. We are definitely going to talk about uh, professional wrestling before we get at the end of the show as well, but let's get to the topic at hand because Paul is very excited to hear what the heck MarTech is. Uh, Marilyn, talk a little bit about your background. I mean, you're, you, you, you've done you've, – you've spanned uh, from Marcom into campaigns into you know a pretty deep role on the marketing technology and CRM side, your current role. Talk a little bit about the evolution of marketing technology as you've seen it and as you've experienced and managed it as well over the last few years. Yeah, I would say you know, I'm one of those fortunate marketers that really came into the space and practice at a time where marketing was really making a shift. So – as I tell people, like, I remember one of the first projects I worked on was deploying this thing called marketing automation, and it was a long time ago. So it's really amazing to see how the space has grown and evolved from being able to send out, like, multi-touch communications and see the behavior attached to it to now predictive analytics and AI, and it's just, it's fascinating to see um, how this has grown. And to what you said earlier, when I got started, I was in the tech space. And so technology companies adopting technology 
that made pretty decent sense. So I think it's really been fascinating to watch how other industries now have started to take practices that have been around for a while and really make it their own and make it work for their business. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, the, we're, you, you, were, you were at Oracle for a while, and now you've been in the last couple of years at the Second City. And for, for those of that may not be familiar with the Second City, it is a it is improv comedy out of Chicago. Um, some of your favorite comics, I'm, I guarantee, come from Second City. Steve Carell, Tina Fey, uh, Bill Murray back in the day. Um, and so my question to you is your, your, your career spans B2B marketing uh, and B2B marketing technology. What the heck does that have to do with improv? comedy. I know. It's fascinating, right? Uh, so I always tell people the story of, of Viola Spolin. So I, it's very important for people to understand that uh, while comedy is a fantastic output of improv, it actually has its um, foundation in communication. So Viola Spolin was a social worker who worked with immigrant children, and she created a series of games to help them to communicate. I mean, a lot of didn't, them didn't speak the same language, and so these games helped them um, work together and, and, again, just assimilate into this new culture and experience that they were a part of. Her son, Paul Sills, uh, went on to the University of Chicago, where he was a part of a group called the Compass Players. The Compass Players eventually became those founding uh, ensemble members of what is now known as the Second City. So while, again, it's, comedy is a, a great output of it, it really has its practices in, in communication. And we have taken these practices and these fundamental um, games and exercises, and, and we bring them into organizations. So we do anything from working with companies to help them develop leadership and teamwork skills to helping companies work with their customer base to identify what their comedic voice is. I, you know, I, and I've seen them in action doing this. I mean, a couple a couple members of your, I think, I mean, they, clearly they'd come up from the improv side and they're working with B2B companies trying to impart improv lessons. Uh, I saw them in action at a conference uh, a couple years ago, and it was phenomenal. I mean, it was obviously very entertaining. They were very funny, but also had a bunch of lessons. So, I mean, so, so talk a little more about, you know, the lessons that you see from improv into B2B sales and marketing. I know, you know, you talk about active listening, you talk about sort of building on what someone else says or some of the things I remember. What are the things that you that really stood out to you in the training and coaching that the improv team does? Uh, I think for me, the biggest thing is the one of the core principles of improvisation, which is the idea of yes and. So it is the idea recognizing and building on the idea of others. And a lot of us don't want to admit it, but we do have a knee-jerk reaction to kind of shoot down an idea when somebody brings something up. Um, and so the idea of yes and is really at the root of, of everything that we, we teach and that we work on. Um, many other improv principles are built into this. So the idea of bring a brick and not a cathedral, that you are not having to do this by yourself rely on the team and the the ensemble that you have around you. Um, so there are just so many really fantastic ideas that help with how you engage and interact with not just those people internal to your organization, but also people that you are you are trying to reach, you're trying to communicate, you are trying to um, better understand. Spend a little time today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Marilyn Cox. She is the director, she's the vice president, excuse me, of marketing and CRM at the Second City, talking a little bit about the impact of improv on sales and marketing. And uh, I don't know if you know uh, Allie McKee. She's a startup founder and CEO out of LA, and she also is a student of improv. She has taken improv classes. And uh, I asked her once, like, what the heck those had to do with each other? And she gave very similar answers. You know, she said, you know, when, in improv, you learn how to listen, in improv, relationships are incredible incredibly important in improv conversations are more successful than monologues humility is critical so she talked about a number of things that are lessons to, to make you better at improv but also better at relationships overall um i want to pivot a little bit uh before we have to take a break here in a couple minutes and, and talk about how you have built uh, sort of your marketing technology stack uh there at second city i know that you were when you came on you were pretty much given the uh, sort of uh, given the keys and said okay build what we need to manage our business and to build 
our own scalable, predictable sales pipeline uh, for that sort of that coaching and business uh, business B two B side. What were your priorities as you did that? I mean, we t- you mentioned at the beginning about the evolution of, of Martech, but when you've give, been given a blank slate, how do you approach that? I, I think the biggest thing, of course, is relying on the internal experts that you work with. So coming into a world that I was very unfamiliar with, I, it was really imperative that I relied on those people that I work with day to day to better understand the business and, and identify those opportunities. And I think for us, what we found was we have an amazing fan base. We have a, a very strong brand that people know and love, but they don't know and are not aware of all of the aspects of our brand. So like you said, people are, are very aware of our alums and they, they know the content that we put on the stages, but they don't know that we have 10,000 plus people that go through our training centers every year that are not looking to be on Saturday Night Live and that we do have this professional services arm um, of what we do. So what we decided to do was really focus on on that fan base, start with our customers and figure out how we could leverage the insight that we had about them and the information they already had about our brand to drive greater awareness. And that's been really what our, our main focus has been these last few years. And talk about as you've evolved over the last couple of years and as you've built that infrastructure, talk about the relationship you have with your sales counterparts at Second City Works. Like how does how does that relationship work and how have you evolved sort of the sales and marketing relationship and output based on that? Yeah, I would say I am so fortunate that I work with such amazing people. Uh, so when I came into the organization, those initial people that I was speaking with were were the sales leaders. Um, and, and they are still the people that I am consulting and speaking with on a day-to-day basis. So we work very, very closely. Uh, any campaign that we are concepting, they are a part of that. We find that we're constantly having to pivot message or pivot how we define even something as as fundamental as like our, our marketing funnel or our sales funnel and relying on them to help drive some of that direction. And because we have that close-knit relationship, I really feel like it's helped us identify opportunities that we probably haven't taken advantage of to the extent that that we could have in years past. So we have a better understanding of what types of of practices and offerings better serve different industries and different roles within companies. And that's really helped us become more successful. Love it. We're going to have to take a quick break here, pay some bills. We're going to be back with a lot more with Marilyn Cox, the Vice President of Marketing and CRM at the Second City. We're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, bright, shiny objects in B2B marketing and how she's either embraced or ignored some of those trends. We're going to definitely get into professional wrestling as well. We'll be right back on Sales Pipeline Radio. It's no longer enough for B2B marketers to feed their sales team with qualified leads, supply them with content, and bid them good luck the rest of the way. Today's full funnel marketers are actively working side by side with the sales team throughout every stage of the buying journey and sales process, embracing revenue responsibility and measuring their impact based on not just sales pipeline contribution, but marketing influence on closed business and direct revenue growth. Download your free copy of Matt Hines' latest book, Full Funnel Marketing at HeinzMarketing.com. That's H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com. Let's pick it back up with Matt and his very impressive guest. She's won her way back into my heart. Her second city is like the holy temple of improvisational comedy. And as somebody who studied that many, many years ago, my hat's off to anybody who's willing to go through this and try this. Uh, it, it really is. That whole idea of yes and is life-changing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I've, I've, you know, I've, I've never studied improv. I am a huge fan of improv. I used to remember the uh, whose line is it anyway? The old version yes. of the Drew Carey version, super yeah. fun to watch. And uh, but yeah, the idea, the idea of yes and. I mean, honestly, the same in the, in the exact same words you would use with but, you could say and, and you completely change the phrase. Yeah, you, exactly. you change the nature of the conversation. I, I show up. Uh, I'm going to set the scene. I show up and my customer is naked. Yes, and what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, again, for joining us here on uh, Sales Pipeline Radio. Uh, if you're enjoying this episode so far in our already diverse conversation with Marilyn Cox, you can get an on-demand replay of this at salespipelineradio.com in just a couple of days. Coming up over the next few weeks as we kind of round out the summer and head into September and the heart of college football season. We've got some great guests coming up. We've got Eli Cohen next week. He is the founder of Saleshood. We're going to be talking about the importance of sales process, the importance of enablement across the entire sales and marketing and revenue op- uh, organizations. Very excited for him. Coming up a little later, we've got Tiffany Bova. She is an evangelist and, and a former uh, distinguished analyst at Gartner, and she is the author of the new book, Growth IQ, How to Get Smarter About the Choices That Will Grow Your Business. Very excited to have her joining us in here in a couple weeks. Uh, today, we have more time with Marilyn Cox. She is the vice president of marketing and CRM at the Second City. And before we get back to talking about some trends in marketing technology, I don't think I've ever really asked you this question, despite the fact we've known each other for a long time. But how exactly did you become a, a, a professional wrestling super fan? I started watching when I was five. You know, I, I came of age in the Hulk Hogan, say your prayers and eat your vitamin years. And I don't know, I just, I, I fell in love with the story and the athleticism. And honestly, as I got older, especially as I've, I've, as I've progressed in my career, uh, I've become a, a huge fan of them as a business. I think that it's really amazing to watch what they've done. They've always been very cutting edge. I mean, they were one of the first organizations that, had an app that was interactive and the audience had a say in who was going to compete in what match. Um, they were the first, one of the first to have a network and everybody thought Vince McMahon was a moron and all of this money he was going to lose on pay-per-views. And, you know, now he's laughing his way to the bank. So yeah, I just, I, I think they're a really interesting business. <laughs> I I agree with you. I mean, I I don't watch uh, clearly. I don't watch as, as much as you do, but I think I, I think of WWE as kind of the um, a successor to Barnum and Bailey. It's kind of become the circus, right? Where it's it's you know, look. It, I mean, there's clearly an awful lot of talent in what those guys are doing, but the the stories, uh, the entertainment value, the fact that quite frankly, even though I mean, it, it still it, it appeals and to 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 you know a widely diverse audience. It is fascinating to break apart. I'm sure there's a Harvard business. Case study on the on the WWE out there somewhere, uh, but I want to get back. We got a few more minutes uh, to to cover here today on Sales Pipeline Radio, and I want to make sure we talk a little more on marketing technology. And, and you know, you uh, I'm sure get pitched uh, dozens of times a day by the thousands of marketing technology vendors out there. As a recipient of those pitches, and I know like there's a handful of us, and you're included, where we kind of share some of the worst ones with each other and email every once in a while. <laughs> um, what stands out to you from those that actually do a good job? Like when you get those unsolicited messages or when you get pitches from vendors, what are some elements of things that actually stand out that get you to take notice? Uh, I think it's what most people will say, which is those reps who have done a good job researching our business. So when they reach out and they understand what we do, uh, that to me is, is certainly what stands out. And then quite honestly, there's a lot to be said for right time. I mean, I have just had some people who have reached out at a point where I have just come out of a meeting going, we need something that solves this problem. So I think that, uh, again, it's, it's, it's right time and, and really understanding who you're, who you're speaking to. So on the other side of that, then, you know, as someone who's reviewing technology options on a regular basis, I mean, you know, as you well know, the technology is not your strategy. It's the implement of your, implementer of your strategy. Are there trends in sales and marketing technology that you think are worth, are worth watching, things that you think um, have started to break out from the clutter and, and are going to become a bigger deal moving forward? You know, maybe I, I will always be the first person to say I am a technology skeptic. There is certainly plenty of tech that I have implemented over my years uh, and, and stuff that I rely on and I know I couldn't do my job without. I would never classify, classify myself as an early adopter. Um, so I tend to, to sit back and watch and, and see what's really going to stick around. Uh, when I go to events and, and content marketing worlds coming up here in, in a week and a half, uh, and 
it is sometimes amusing for me to walk the trade show floor, the expo floor, and see how um, companies pivot their product and message year to year based on what like the new trend is. So those types of things I, I, I do kind of watch out for. I would say, quite honestly, stuff that I'm really intrigued by is is anything having to do with um, experiential marketing. Uh, I really think, in my opinion, that is going to be uh, a trend that will continue to increase. We are seeing aspects of it with virtual reality and what people are trying to do, but I think that VR type of technology is going to push like traditional demos and uh, that type of experience to a new level. Uh, It's going to force organizations to think a little bit more about how they drive interaction, whether it's face-to-face at an event. Um, or it is something that occurs online, and it's allowing people to be more a part of of the the organization and the brand. So that is what I'm really interested in in exploring and seeing what happens. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that you know, there's so you, you mentioned content marketing world coming up. More and more companies doing content, which ultimately means, uh, if you look at it, a lot of companies doing it poorly, right? People that are doing thinly veiled sales pitches in their white papers and their blog posts. And so, I think even the customer centric content is out there. Um, and if it's in the same old formats, it can get it can get caught in the clutter as well. So, something that is personalized, something that's experiential, something that is a two way communication versus a one way communication, I think starts to stand out. Uh, a little bit more. Um, what are what are some th- other things that you're looking forward to? You know, as we go into next year, uh, things that you're looking at across sales and marketing. You know, without thinking about this, just as uh, from a technology standpoint, um, you know, how much are you guys thinking about? I've seen noticed a lot of people thinking more about full customer lifestyle versus just acquisition. What are some thematic areas that are becoming more important for you as you as you start to look into the new year? Yeah, for us, it really is continuing to grow that relationship and that customer experience. And we are in a what I would classify as a pretty unique situation because we are B2C and we are B2B and we are brick and mortar and we are online. I'm a big fan of watching what companies like uh, the Golden State Warriors have done. Um, and so we're really focusing on how we can do more with driveway to driveway experiences Um, And so what does that look like from that first touch that you have with a customer all the way through any type of face-to-face interaction and then afterwards? Um, And then how do we make sure that it's something that's very unique and um, special to that individual uh, and very authentic? So I would say that that for us is what we're going to continue to focus on here in the coming year and creating more of that driveway to driveway experience. It's really interesting. And I think, you know, they think I've never heard it described that way, driveway to driveway. But I think, you know, it's very becoming clear that the organizations that sort of blur the lines between channels and create a really immersive and a really uh, sort of integrated experience for their customers uh, are those that are going to win. Uh, I liked what you talked about earlier, too, in terms of, you know, leveraging some of the relationships and brand you have with the Second City on the sort of on the consumer side uh, to really sort of drive leverage uh, on, on the B2B side as well. You know, even though you're selling to a business, uh, there's people within that business that are making purchase decisions and, you know, you might as well leverage the assets that you have. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. I just wondering because they're such good communicators, have they ever thought about doing a business podcast about improvisation? I, I'm, there's a million comedy podcasts out there, and they could easily do that with all the talent they have. But a podcast that shows and sort of demonstrates on a week to week basis how to use improvisational skills to transform your your team, your sales team, and your marketing team. Well, that's a lovely setup, Paul. Um, as, <laughs> See? As a matter of fact. As a matter uh, of fact. We, we do have a podcast. Um, it's called Getting to Yes And. And it is hosted by Kelly Leonard, who was, for a number of decades, our executive producer at the Second City. He's responsible for uh, the careers of folks like Tina Fey and Stephen Colbert and Amy Poehler. Um, And he now works a lot on our B2B side and really paying attention to 
the role of improvisation and human behavior. And so he's had guests on like Simon Sinek and he's had Alan Alda on and he's had Brene Brown. Um, and so a hundred percent, like it is a, it's a really fascinating podcast because there are so many people out there and, and so many thought leaders that are using these practices um, and, and to hear them all talk about it together and how they are implementing it into not just their thought leadership, but a lot of their day-to-day -day interactions with the people that they work with. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great podcast. So I would encourage everyone to tune in and listen. <laughs> Well, that couldn't have been planned any better. My goodness, that's fantastic. Yeah. And we'll definitely, we will make sure we've got a link to that podcast in our show notes when we publish this uh, up on Sales Pipeline Radio. We just have a couple more minutes with Marilyn Cox. She's the Vice President of Marketing and CRM at the Second City. And uh, Marilyn, I'm curious, you know, if, if I were to ask you who are some of the people that you've learned the most from, that you've been the most inspired by, that have helped you learn and grow in your career uh, professionally, you know, that they could be alive uh oh, did we lose Matt here in his final question here? Oh, I think I he's. Know. And that, it was going to be deep. I, it, could I can tell. Well, <laughs> what he always wants to know is who who's your heroes? Who's on your Mount Rushmore of marketing people? Oh, goodness. Um, so I have to point to some of the people that played a, a huge role in, in, in my evolution and, and what I learned. So um, folks like Joe Chernoff, who I know you guys had on just a couple weeks ago. Yes, we did. Uh, yeah. I still, yeah, like anything Joe writes, I'm going to read and try to figure out how to emulate. Um, Steve Woods and Paul Tashima, who were responsible for Eloqua and now have Nudge AI. I think they're constantly looking to push the boundaries on on behavior and understanding human behavior and decision making. So I, I certainly love and, and, and really appreciate anything they have to to share and, and that they're talking about and what they're building. I and it's not just because I'm on his podcast, but I, I Matt is great. I mean I've I've known Matt now for probably close to ten years. Oh, wow. And really, yeah, I know. And it's fascinating to see what he's done and, and what he's done with his business and where he's taken it. So, so Matt and, and of course, Brian Hansford, um, the stuff that they write and publish, I, I think, is, is great. And I really appreciate how they, they, they look at very practical applications. Um, and I think a lot of times when you look at analysts and, well, there are some really – um, excellent models that can be adopted and stuff from uh, those types of organizations. Uh, I, I've always appreciated the stuff that, that Matt and Brian has put out because it is very practical how-to type of work. So, Matt, we're back. Yes, and what else can you add to that? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to cry over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, um, yes, and – I am so appreciative that you joined us. I know we had kind of a last-minute cancellation, and uh, I've wanted to get you on the show for a long time. I really appreciate you clearing up schedule a little bit and joining us today. Thank you to our guest, Marilyn Cox, Vice President of Marketing and CRM at the Second City. If you want to replay this episode and share it with some of the folks on your team, you'll find it on salespipelineradio.com in just a couple of days, and we will have an edited transcript and si hummer, uh, highlights uh, blog post from this episode, including a link to the yet Getting to Yes and podcast from the Second City on HeinzMarketing.com in a few days. Thanks very much again for joining us. For my great producer, Paul, this is Matt Heinz. We'll see you next time on Sales Pipeline Radio. You've been listening to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio brought to you by the great folks at Matt Heinz Marketing. 